Okay, I've decided that I'm just going to give ideas. I'm going to put ideas out. I'm not going to try to describe kind of where I sit in the world and what I'm trying to do with my life or anything like that because you wouldn't understand. And when I describe to people, they just don't understand. So um, it's not important. Um, what is important is the ideas I have in my head that I think if if they are worthy um, and could change the world, that would be great. But I get the feeling that um, nothing I can ever do, even if I was, if I had the money to, nothing I can ever do will have any effect on the world. And, um, is it so the idea is is that no amount no amount of if people put me in power tomorrow to like control the world it would have no effect and i would just choose not to to control it in the first place because i have limited life and it's going to get screwed up once i leave the picture so all i can do is present kind of my utopian paradise of what it would be like if I really thought the world could change. Um, this is so that I'm, I'll just be presenting ideas. I'll just be throwing ideas out there. And if somebody thinks they can make money doing it, if somebody thinks that it can fix the world, go with it. But um, I don't care to be attributed any inkling of identity with it. I don't care. Um, I would just rather disown an idea. I, I have no interest in pursuing research or any of that. It's, um, that's, I think that it's probably an identity of somebody who thinks they got truth is that they're just going to disown the truth because, um, trying to, anytime you try to make something, um, work, um, and anytime you try to cash in on an idea, um, there's greater chance you're going to screw it up. So the best thing to do is just put, if you believe something to be true, just put it out there and let someone else own it. Let them deal with that issue of um, whether they can make it work commercially for them or not. Um, I would rather just have um, good ideas. I, I, I believe that truth should be free. Um, if the Bible is true, it should be free. You shouldn't be charging for the Bible. Um, you should be putting all your, you should be putting a tithe, all your money into the production of Bibles if you believe the Bible to be true. They, they, all the Bibles that exist on the shelf should all be free. If you think that, um, people, need to be buying those and um, if it is your livelihood to do that then I don't think you're really t studying or even learning it if you're I don't think you're actually even reading it because um, it would if you if it were the pearl that you were seeking after if it was like that man who got that one pearl and sold everything he had for that one pearl um, that would be the Bible. And if you actually believed that it was true, you would be giving it away for free. But such is not the case in as proof that the people of this world don't understand that um, truth needs to be free. Um, if, it, if something is true, it needs to be free. They figure if you're selling it, then that's proof that it is true. It's, um, people are, will decide if it is truth, if it makes sense, um, if it has relevance, um, if it exhibits the behaviors that we see around us. But um, the standards of our world should be based on 
that that are true if anything is true if, if there are to be standards on which we base everything we do in in our world our morality it must be free and it must be openly distributed information it needs to be voiced and people need to discuss it and they need to they need to test it and they need to figure out why certain things are you know they need to um, question so that's that's the thing is is that until i see of the world the kind of things that i expect to be if there were Christians in the world, um, then I probably will exhibit the behaviors necessary to be following that book. But I, um, I, what I'm doing is I'm just engineering um, with the the things that Jesus talked about in the Bible. I'm engineering the ideas, and I'm I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to um, present to people that they need to consider eth the ethics and um, to just consider the ideas, not really believe them, um, not really believe any of it, you know, because um, it's one of those works that have been around for such a long time and there is something to relativism um, determining truth based on your culture and, and the world where you're at in the world um, what you're doing you determine your own truths and it's kind of relative to people around you the problem with that is is that um, if your culture is vastly different from people somewhere else in the world and you come to meet up with them you will war you will come into a great conflict because your cultures do not agree. And that's, that's the problem with relativism is, is that um, in order for um, truth to actually, in order for truth to actually work, everybody has to be on the same page. They have to understand the others. It, they have to understand why they differ and why their cultures um, do not agree why they why they their truths do not are not true you know what is true and what is not true they need to to determine how they differ and why they differ and what's to blame for that and not to just assume that other people are complete idiots um, because everybody um everybody has the intent to do good it's built into us it's a part of our brain it's called an amygdala and the amygdala is there to help us recognize um recognize other people as being like ourselves and until we understand that uh the beings outside of us are people you know, people of different races are people that are just like us. Until we realize that, even though people think we are already at that level, we're not really at that level. When we have a black president and everybody tries to make him out to be um, a Muslim, you know, or that they've demonified Muslims, um, and are fail to recognize him as being someone who has the intent to do good then it really says that we are failing on empathy we're failing our amygdala we're we're being um distracted by emotion we're not using our our brains we're not trying to understand other people and and the same people that can say well you know i wish the country would we would just agree to, to try to fix the problem and it's never going to happen if you the minute if you have two people that have different worldviews and they're talking to each other and you have one guy that walks up and says you both are crazy that guy just got written out of the whole discussion he can't even enter into discussion to even discuss with those people because they won't respect him he just dissed them 
and by dissing them, he cannot enter into the discussion at all. And that's the problem we face. That's the reason why we will never agree, or we're, we're kind of not going to agree on anything, is because we're not willing to listen to each other. We're not willing to actually even consider that somebody else actually thinks because we are so we are so um, controlled by our emotion. We're distracted. We're easily distracted. We have no self-control. If we had self-control, we wouldn't get distracted. But the fact that we are so easily distracted means that we don't have self-control. And that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And if we're all distracted here, uh, how can we even be... Um, how can we ever even actually have any kind of salvation? And um, so it, it leads me back to kind of how can I even tell that I'm still in a world that has Christ in it or even has God in it? And it's, it's the canary in the coal mine. Um, the people that say bless you, um, they, they say have a blessed day. That's true. That's that's ritual. You're creating ritual. You're cre creating traditions. Is what you're doing. You're creating. Um, your when you say that um, God bless America, that you're creating. Um, you're creating something that that doesn't have any basis in reality. Um, you're instilling a hope, but you're you don't realize that you're if you're not actually putting your money into it you're you're not really blessing just saying somebody to have a blessed day is is really kind of ignoring their situation pretending like they they don't really exist and so if you're not exhibiting all the attributes of what it is that you believe in or you say you believe in if you're not exhibiting it and you're not, you don't have the fruits of, of good in you and you're not really helping or changing the world, how can you even expect to convert anyone to your, to your worldview? You can't, and it's just not going to happen. And so um, it's better to just assume that it's not going to have any effect than to say, that you are having an effect because when you say you are having an effect, that's arrogance. And so, um, you, the thing is to, to assume is, is that, um, is that all you can do is kind of just try to do better and, um, but not, not to see anybody else is doing it worse. And realize that um, um, what I do is really probably not going to have any effect. Um, I would like I do see solutions. I do see things that people don't. I mean, usually the cop outs that people come up with um, to me seem kind of shallow. And um, for instance, today I was talking to somebody about. Um, how we could have a better identification system rather than using social security numbers. We could use what I had worked with a friend of mine on, something called PIDS. Um, pay, it was called um, Personal Identification uh, System or something. And it's P-I-D-S. Uh, it it, the standard is uh, defined at the OMG. That's the objectmanagementgroup.org and uh, it was created in the early 2000s by Los Alamos National Laboratories. It's, um, the, it was the Telemed project and what they were working on was a way to get hospitals and clinics connected um, in a peer-to-peer -peer model. And the reason why a peer-to-peer -peer model is because that's how the internet works. That's the reason why the internet works so well is that what makes it work is it's a protocol it it's there's no it's not a spoken hub model 
um, all businesses tend to prefer to have spoke hub models for what are also called star networks. Um, a star network is what you get whenever you turn on your TV. You're watching somebody at a central location where the video is getting distributed from to everybody's sets and they're all getting it serviced from one server. If that server went down, then we wouldn't get that information and so we wouldn't see those people in that in that network. And that's called a star network because it comes from one central source. The internet permits us all to interact and um, for us to all be stars. And that's the identity of a peer-to-peer -peer network. That's the reason why people can tr can uh, can distribute um, stuff illegally is because um, everybody has the capacity to serve as well as as um, receive um, the same to receive information. Just as I am now putting my face before you from YouTube, and you're watching me, I have the capacity to be a star, and and. But the thing is, is that the more of us are doing this, the less we are really capable of being as big and important as somebody on a television network. And that's just what happens because um, when you're in a peer-to-peer -peer model, nobody can be more important than anybody else unless people just agree to pay more attention to one particular individual um, because it's a peer-to-peer -peer model it is not a star network it's we're not going to one server to get our information we are with YouTube but we have a choice we have a choice of many different servers to go to and we wouldn't have that choice if the internet wasn't a peer-to-peer -peer model and if it hadn't have been a peer-to-peer -peer model it wouldn't have worked. Um, we couldn't use America Online. Everybody in the world started to use America Online and when it it hit a uh, high density, um, the the um, the joke was it, people would call it America Offline because you could never get on to actually do anything of worth. And that's the reality is, is that you can't make you can't make um, star networks work the way they worked before anymore. It'll never work that way. And our healthcare system can't work that way. Um, the business systems can't work that way. None of it can work that way. We must ad adapt to using peer-to-peer -peer models and servicing and um, because that's how we're connected to the, 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 now the internet now the genie's out of the bag there's nothing you can do to put it back into the bag and get back to um, a monopoly of information and um, the social security number is not a good identifier um, just think about it when you identify yourselves do you identify yourself as a number or do you identify yourself by the picture you can see me from this angle, from this angle. These are two identities. The, um, this is one side, this is another side. There's this another side. Those are all parts of my identity. Um, my retinal scan is another part of my identity. My fingerprint is another part of my identity. Um, my blood type is a, another part of my identity. Where I live, my name, are all parts of my identity. Um, numbers that are associated with database records at particular clinics can also be part of my identity. Um, those all together collectively be, are, increase the importance of the identity of the identifier. Um, the identifier becomes more um, relevant the more of these identifiers are associated with it and it's and what really makes them more um, relevant is how they are used to identify me whereas a number 
really doesn't do much outside of the database in which it was it associates information actual identifiers that make sense for a person are their face um, their blood type their name um, their family history things that are on Facebook can be used as identifiers the more information there is about you in databases and those are collected together to identify you that creates your identifier that is your identifier and that is how you would um, better get your healthcare records together get everything collected together into one place and it may be the case that Facebook becomes the way that we collect all of our healthcare records together um, to use Facebook to to um, do that or something you know because the people on Facebook are uh, know you are on Facebook whenever you say you're on Facebook and you've shared things with through them through your Facebook and you're able to you're able to prove your existence on it then it becomes a relevant identifier the social security number is not relevant um, it's relevant because the government's associating you with it but it isn't relevant because it is a number in their database and it doesn't really identify you it doesn't it doesn't have your face it, it doesn't exhibit what your face looks like it doesn't exhibit your blood type or where you're at in the world or you know the sound of your voice it doesn't have any of that in it you can only hope that the government has that stuff associated with that number in their database but collectively that could be made an object and called a identifier it's an object identifier it's a collection of things and you can use statistics to determine how relevant each of the identifiers are that are in that collection and when you go to go to a doctor and they need to collect your records together you can just provide them several different identifiers and then they would be able to go to a database put in those things those ids and then the database the peer-to-peer -peer system could could do a search like you do on the internet using those identifiers you could do a search and possibly collect together all the various records you have at various institutions the way to um, validate the person who's re uh, who's doing the search who's requesting them is to request from them their identifier their um their cert certificate certifications their um public key their pu their signature their their encrypted signature there are ways to do this to make it the same way what we do business on the internet by using um certificate authorities to determine whether or not the person you're dealing with is a real person and it's also the same way that you determine if you're getting if there's someone in between you and the server that's eavesdropping on your connection if there's a middleman attack is by determining that the certificate that is getting sent to the guy on the other end is the same one that's coming from your browser if they're not the same then there's uh, a middleman attack so there are ways of verifying if there are people there who don't have the um who, who might be uh interceding might be doing something between you and someone on the net we have ways of fixing that with um using public key encryption as the as the technology and way to think about public key encryption is it's like a it's like a funnel and it's like a megaphone it's it's tapered at one end it's wide on the other end the wide end of the megaphone is or the or the funnel um, the information funnel the wide end is called the public key and you give that to everybody and then the the tapered end 
which is really just for you is called the private key. And every time you make a connection, a secure connection to a service on the internet, um, a business like Amazon, using a secure sockets layer, and that's when, if you look in your URL and it says HTTP, and then there's an S, that S means secure. And that means that your browser and the server are going to do some public key encryption to in, do an initial handshake uh, that when they get together. And then once they um, have verified with, they get verified via certificate authority that the guy on the server and your bra web browser that you're working with are just are um are authentic um that there's nobody in between um dealing there's nobody in between that that is interceding for you or um who's taking your stuff and and passing it on there's no middleman attack then you can actually do some business and it does that process by using public key encryption um uh, to determine that the that it was because the one of the things about public key encryption is is that if the guy on the server g gets your public key he's actually getting your public key then any kind of information he encrypts with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key which you have and that's the reason why it's a, a, a funnel why it's a tapered at one end and um, when they, it's only the pro, it's only the handshake, the initial um, connection between the, you and that server that that's actually done. Um, further communication is done with things called symmetric keys. And the difference between public keys and are, are asymmetric, which are called public key encryption, asymmetric keys and symmetric keys is asymmetric keys uh, what a key is is it's a matrix it's um it's a like a 2d matrix of uh, if you've taken matrix um math or anything like that it, it is a it's a matrix and um there's ways to encrypt information using these matrices uh matrices of numbers and um the the um, the way encryption works, um, if it's a symmetric key, then the transpose of the matrix can be used to decrypt something that was encrypted with, so that the with a symmetric key, the key that the guy's using on the other end is the same key you're using, but it is just transposed, and so but when both of you are using that same key to encrypt information, the chances of somebody being able to decrypt it in between are very, are not likely, okay? Um, you still can have middleman attacks, but um, you do that by verifying, by, by doing the certificate authority stuff. And um, anyhow, there's a whole science to that, and, it's, and it works 100% well and you can detect uh, a middleman attack and um, you need certificate authorities and a certificate authority in the sense with the medical industry would be the colleges you went to to get your degree that could be a certificate authority those would be the people that would be able to verify that you are the doctor you say you are and um, that they would give like little checks to see, to verify your identity. And once they established your identity, then they could say, you do have your, your, you still have your medical license. You have the authority to request information, healthcare information from any clinic that's available in the network that um, might have information on you. And, how they do this query would be to send out um, the most, um, either to send out the identifiers that identify you or to send out a reference to 
your identifiers to the to the to the stuff you have, and then have them be able to do um, identifier checks, uh, uh, statistical uh, analysis, um, fuzzy logic, um, AI logic, um, anything that would be able to help um, to identify um, to quickly identify records that exist at various places that um, that would be you based upon the statistical probability of all the various identifiers that were presented at each institution, such as your address information, your, your name, your um, blood type, um, um, possibly fingerprints, retinal scans, anything that, that you might provide the doctor in order to access your records. And it may be the case that you might not even be able to, you might not be there to, to offer that, or you might be there to offer that, but the doctor, you might be unconscious. You might be on a operating table and you are in a coma or something and the doctor has to work on you and needs to find out if you um, are, if you have uh, contraindications, um, um, if, you, if you might go into shock by having some certain kind of, um, of uh, anesthesia and they don't want to work with uh, a patient if they don't fully understand their physical makeup and their um, um, immune problems and things that things that might um, might make the surgery go wrong and, and because they have a concern for um, malpractice suit part of that is not understanding your physical makeup and they didn't have you to actually sign a document saying that you would that you would be able to pass that on they might not even know who you are and that and the only way they're going to be able to determine that is by having access to well they have you they have you as a as a person what if your id gets lost what if you were uh, homeless and you were um maybe you had dementia and you had completely forgotten who you were or you 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 know, somebody who was in a nursing home and you ended up out on the streets somewhere and nobody knows where you've gone to, um, how would they identify you? Um, they would maybe use facial recognition, retinal scans, various sorts of things. And what if you were freezing and they found you, you know, barely alive, frozen, and the surgeon needs to work on you because you're in some certain state? Um, how are they going to be able to pull up your records in that kind of state? You, the way to do it is to use multiple, use anything that you have to identify you, facial recognition, retinal scans, all of it together. And that will, the statistics will be in your favor when they have your body there and they have to operate on you to know, um, what they need to know and what will determine whether or not they get that information is if they are a doctor, they are American or, you know, or they're, they're from your country. They, and they have a history with you and people know them and, you know, all this stuff, they can do all of that really quickly with, um, uh, several, several, institutions at which they got their degree um, can assess that they are the right person and, and collect that information together. Um, how you can keep your information in control is by, um, it is if the government would provide people a place where they could control access of all their information to every single party, um, institution by institution, you know, so like if you went to a clinic and you had an HIV test and you don't want people to know about this, especially if you're a political figure, um, you could say in your, in your 
profile that certain clinics that you went to could not divulge their information to the people in the outside and um, you could even set it up in such a way that at the clinic you could say you cannot divulge information that I was ever here and um, so that when the queries come out and they see the query they they don't say oh um, we can't give you information they don't say anything at all they don't respond um, if they respond they just respond uh, we haven't seen this guy we we don't know this guy and that's that if they even affirm that we can't give you information and it was an HIV clinic then we know that they had an HIV test and that's still damning so the thing is is just to say no um, I've never we've never seen this guy and that is how you set that up how you secure that is by setting up the clinic that they can't divulge information when and and do it in a digital format and um, and uh, so there's ways that this can be done it's just that people are not um, there you see I presented the idea it's out there I I've told you where this information exists um, there's something called hills PIDs um, um, it's it's just look for telemed at the omg.org a guy by the name of David Kilman I worked with him I was um, not involved with telemed but I knew people who were and um, I don't know where David is today, but he spearheaded the research on this. And the reason why is because he was in his his primary um, his primary interest was in artificial intelligence, and he had an idea that to use computers and robots to operate on people. And as a prerequisite to that, he needed to have um, access to people's uh, digital um, records, to have access to their medical records and being able to give information to the computer. I mean, what he was working on was kind of really kind of out there. Like, you know, there's, there's like no chance at the time that he was coming into it that you could actually do what he wanted to do. It, to him, it was a fantasy to do it. But then he found out that the healthcare institutions, the whole healthcare industry, is not even far enough along to even compete to to even provide a digital patient record at all, and what he called a a um, a um, um, uh, something grave to what was a birth to grave. Um, um, he, 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 there, it, there's a term for it, but the idea is, is to have a complete record of all your information from the time you were born to the time you died. Um, and, I don't know what it's called, but in uh, anyhow, that that's the idea, and uh, this the technology exists, and. Uh, the reason why it's probably not it's probably the case that it's not in operation and they the guys who implemented PIDs um, care data systems which have Don, uh, John Farmer uh, was uh, part of this project uh, I mean he was he was provided um, their first implementation of something that they had proposed a proposal um, that they requested it was like an RFC a request for comment um, people suggesting ways to do this and they came up with the PID system they came up with a way of doing it and um, used CORBA to establish the interface and uh, the there are a lot of people that say CORBA is ter terrible technology um, keep in mind that CORBA was designed in such a way t as to take um, systems who were that were not designed to be object oriented and make them objects so you could actually take a legacy system a very old machine 
possibly running on uh, running with um, COBOL, um, um, the common uh, the, the business language that everybody hates in computer science um, that is used in lots of businesses and still will be forever because people became dependent upon it a long time ago and is what a lot of business uh, businesses rely on to do business oriented stuff. You can take a COBOL based um, program um, and wrap it up in a, in a CORBA in a Cobra, um, my yeah, it's not Cobra. Cobra's um, what what we get whenever we uh, when we lose our jobs and it gives us like a year and a half of uh, insurance. Corba is a common request broker um, l language. What it is is it's basically a protocol like the internet. So a TCP/IP is a protocol. Corba is a kind of a protocol and. Uh, what it is is it's, it, it permits you to create, uh, it, to do object interfacing between, um, it just permits you to do object, it, um, changing my lighting on my face here. Um, it permits you to do objects, to make anything into an object, any computer into an object, and um, make it work the way um, and the idea behind Corva, the, the reason for it, as David told me this, was that it was really designed to um, provide inter-process communication between multiple servers in a parallel programming environment. So it was designed from the get-go to work in parallel for parallel processing. And so for anybody, even Microsoft, which is he thought that Microsoft had something to do with the reason why Corba isn't used today, um, possibly by um, perverting people's ideas about how it could actually be um, acceptable. You know, um, Microsoft always vouches for things that are file formats like XML. Um, XML is is can't be used. You can't. Um, verify compliance with a data format. You need an object interface format. And that's only going to be done with something like Corba. You can't do that with XML. XML, if you make anything a file format, if it's something like a language that can be parsed, um, you can, languages permit you to obfuscate, to make things, to hide information, to make things dependent upon syntax that you can't use that as the basis for a for any kind of um, in for any kind of uh, interfacing you can't use that as the basis for um, compliance interface compliance it, interfaces need to be um, based on objects they can't be based on data um, messaging XML um, you can use XML to do the message passing, but the interfacing needs to be done on an object level. It needs to be done with um, defined types and um, a flat interface. And um, to to do, and you would have to do some amount of handshaking. Um, and the importance in this is so that you send only the essential information that needs to be sent along to the person requesting it, not the entire record, which is what will happen um, in most cases. You know, and this is, he was saying this was happening with HL7. They were sending, they would send like entire records um, rather than just sending the essential information. And the only thing that HL7 really it works with is insurance coding of people's um, pr procedures. It has nothing to do with our healthcare at all. Um, and that was what he was working on, was trying to get our healthcare records into a format that could be, um, that in, in, in that they could be correlated to using PIDs in such a way as to like actually get, um, 
to actually create a distributed peer-to-peer -peer model of keeping all of our healthcare record together. And there are a lot of people out there that say, well, maybe we don't need that. Uh, anytime you go to a doctor and they have to verify all of your medical history and you have to write it down, that's because of HIPAA. And HIPAA requires that you do one of two things. You either pass your paper records around by hand in a sneaker net, um, or if you're going to do it over the internet, that it'd be 100% secure and that no insurance company can eavesdrop and get access to your healthcare information. And so usually they just chicken out of that one and they go for the paper records. That's the that's kind of what they do now and they haven't even tried to do the second one. The only ones that are doing the second one, from what I've been told, is France. France uh, hit, took on our telemed product and is implementing PIDs and, and some of that stuff. And you know who else is using PIDs? Um, um, the, I heard that the um, one of the drugstore chains um i'm trying to remember their name uh cm cms is it cms or um the one with the c that's got three letters in it and that's out of new york they supposedly are using pids internally um for their own being able to identify something they're they're doing it they're using corba internally um i heard and my friend david said that cnn is using it for their records or something so there are people out there using such things and there and john farmer told me that um, care data was using pids um to recognize uh, aliens passing over the border to mexico by using um they're using tattoos as identifiers. So skin, when you got a tattoo, that's an identifier. Um, nobody else is gonna have that tattoo and to have that tattoo on their skin is, you know, you've already got yourself an, an, a relevant identifier on you if you've got a tattoo. If you've got multiple tattoos, those are all identifiers. And if for some reason you end up in a coma, in a wreck, it could save your life to have those tattoos because then they can they can run those scans and uh and run it through a database and come back with your hopefully your patient records if we had that stuff in place which i don't think they have and if the government had it in place then there wouldn't be any identity theft it would not really it would be practically impossible for identity theft to occur because the people who are doing the thieving, um, it's in their best interest to not have, um, to have only essential identifiers, simple identifiers, things that can be easily cloned and, and, and used. Um, retinal scans are not easy. Um, fingerprints are not easy. Um, if you've ever looked at the movie Gattaca, the kind of stuff that that guy's having to do to prove that he is um, um, a pure, that he's not somebody who has bad DNA, is an example of the same sort of thing that, n not to say that that's what you would have, but the kind of the things he has to go through to fake his identity is the kind of things that somebody who is going to try to take and make money off of you would have to do in the existence of a, such a database method of a peer-to-peer -peer model of statistically associating healthcare records based upon uh, uh, these identifiers and the identifiers that you use for your records are the same identifier um, process that your doctor would use to identify themselves when they're going to get access to your records uh, especially in the case that it's a doctor that you don't know that you ended up in a coma or you ended up in a wreck and lost some of your identifying features. Maybe your arm got chopped off. So one top tattoo got lost in the process. They don't know where it is. It, it burned up. So they don't have that, but then they have some other tattoos. They have retinal. Um, hopefully your eyes remain intact. You see, that's the reason why you need multiple 
points of reference. Uh, you, having just one identifier is not going to do it. Um, having a chip in your body is not a solution. Uh, that was what this lady was saying to me whenever I was working in a, and I said, and she said under her breath, she said, well, it's going to mean we have to put chips in ourselves, you know, and I'm not going to do that. And I told her, no, uh, that, that that's not a solution. That's not the way you do it. <laughs> the way you do it is, is, is by a combination of identifiers. A simple numeric identifier is a stupid thing. It, you need a combination. The whole, the whole conglomerate of information is your identifier it's a real identifier um it makes sense it makes human sense to call it an identifier because that's how you present yourself to your friends that's how they know you who you are is because they they've seen you they know what you look like they know how you talk they they understand you uh, you an, one way of even identifying your record could be that um that that record is yours or that you're who they who you say you are would probably be through friends recognizing you as who you are by you know maybe the doctor who's trying to get access to the to the records would have to do a verification check according to the, what the, the the little specifications you had in your record that they have to provide they have to verify with a friend that you are you know that that it is your body so maybe they send pictures along through that search and um, when it goes to your particular doctor the doctor says we've got a photo here that's obviously um, your friend but can you um, do a verification to make sure this is this is um, you know that this matches up so your own friends might actually be part of your identifier um, so that's a, a solution to the problem but it is not a it is not a um, intuitive it's not something that people would arrive at by intuition. And the reason why people solve problems, will always think of problems as being things that would be make sense by intuition is, is that um, our businesses don't have any interest of actually doing any amount of deep work into actually fixing problems. They tend to think from a business end and to solve pr problems with money and when you try to solve problems with money if there's no intent to actually fix the problem um, you're going to be thinking of it from a position of survival and that is not a way of like actually coming up with good solutions because when you think of survival you think of um, you also think of politics you there are certain things you fear that are going to prevent you from going forward. And it takes a government to come up with solutions like this. And that's the reason why I tend to be more socialistic than capitalistic. I don't trust companies. And the reason why is because any idea that I've ever had, if I ever tried to make money off of it, I'd have to do something that is like feels like lying to try to make it work. And so it doesn't make any interest in for me to take anything and try to make money off of it. it. It just feels wrong. So especially if it's a standard. Now, it doesn't feel wrong if it was like a paint program, if I was creating some special technology that permits you to like actually be able to um, take in motion capture data from video. Um, by using artificial intelligent algorithms to recognize the motions that a dog makes or things like that and being able to translate that into actual 3D. That would be something that's sellable and that doesn't require you to make ethical decisions, you know, to, to like actually um, have a juxtaposition of money, of being able to survive and make money and juxtapose that against um, making something work. Um, if 
if if the necess the if it's necessary for something to work, um, it must be put in GPL. It must be made free. It must be um, accessible to everybody in the world. Um, if it is not, then it won't be secure. It won't be guaranteed to actually work. It won't. People won't have agreement that it can work. Um, when you limit it to corporations, they have every interest. It's it in each of their interests to figure out some way that they can survive on it, and it will work against the consumer. It will work for the company itself. They won't have any intent on making it work, and so that's the reason why you have to pass standards over to the government, why you have to have whistleblowers in the government. You can't have whistleblowers in corporations that just will not work because anybody who is is doesn't have the faith to like actually um, go out on a limb um, will not be able to to maintain that standard to keep it um, effective. They they have to agree to, to disown if they have any ideas they have to present their truths and they have to disown it they can't make money off of it. they can't um, and if they do make money off of it it would be an open standard it would be something that everybody has agreed to um, but as I stated you can't use XML as a uh, as a standard for interfacing because um, it is it's, it is a language it's a storage format it's a method of storing information and um, how much information do you need to describe what you need to pass along does it have to all be in one format or can it be in multiple little messages um, it would be more efficient if um, if you had a choice of either sending everything along or only sending what you need to, to send along and that can be done more easily with an object interface than it can be done with a data format and to see with XML um, XML can, is a way of encapsulating many objects together um, that is not efficient for communication for interaction between systems it is more efficient that they be using many different kinds of objects that are each um, messages um, simple messages as to defining what it is exactly that is needed um, and sending only that stuff along and the simpler the the um, interaction is, the better. Um, not to say that you should have less than identifiers in your system. You should have any number of identifiers necessary. Um, you should have a simple set of identifiers always, like a blood type and things like that, things that are not going to um, impinge on people's rights and uh, politically or you know not, nothing that's going to ruin a person uh, that's that can only help them as uh, to 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 get health care or help to, to identify them those things are the you need to price as greatest importance um, the security of the individual the security of their health care and in a and make it open and accessible um, available and to the institutions make it easy for them to integrate um, if you it seems like the only time that the hospitals can really be integrated uh, clinics can be integrated into hospitals is when a company takes over a clinic and then forces on that clinic to use their master patient ID to bring their records into the grand record database and then it's up to them to determine which 
records belong to the same patient in each institution. That seems to be the only way that businesses, healthcare um, systems, um, can ever integrate, and it's stupid. It's and it and it doesn't work that well. And it would be better to use um, complex um, identifiers uh, rather than simple numeric identifiers. Those are not relevant. And so you need object oriented. You need to be object oriented. You need to use something like Corba or use um, uh, something that sends simple messages, flat interfaces. Um, a simple listing of of methods, a simple listing of, of of functional, you know, I'm asking for this information with these special identifiers, you know, or these arguments, and uh, that's only going to, that's how you determine your compliancy is whenever the, the interface is, um, when the when the service on the other end has um, certain interfaces implemented, and those interfaces can be easily defined. Anybody who understands object oriented design knows what an interface is. Whenever it comes to an object, it's simply the de definition of all the functions and the number of arguments that are accepted and the types of those arguments the types of the data that can be transferred uh, and uh, returned um, with each function call and the name of the function and um, the and to have things like the the namespace all of that is defined in in Corba it's all there it's been there for two decades and not a damn thing is being done about it and um, people are still under the the idea in our government that they need to be using social security numbers, which is bullshit. We don't need to even use that. We would fix our, we would have fixed our identity crisis yesterday if this telemed stuff was in our government and was being used for our healthcare record systems and helping people to identify people across clinics. This would have fixed problems we got in the healthcare industry, where we've got people who are faking their, um, their, um, they're faking um, their diagnosis, or they're they're um, pretending to have healthcare problems because they have, say, dependencies on oxycontin, you know, and so they're jumping from doctor to doctor. If you had a unified healthcare record system, one that uses peer-to-peer uh, -peer model like I'm talking about, you would be able to track and prevent people from from getting into those addictions and from having that. And, and that's where a private industry would not be able to deal with that problem because it would be against their wishes, especially if they were selling OxyContin and they knew there were people that were abusing it, they're making money off of it, why would they want to fix it? And now you see the reason why private industry will never fix things um, that make business sense to them. Um, it, and it, there's a reason why in the Bible it says the love of money is the root of all evil. And the reason why it's there is because Jesus was passed over to the to the uh, Romans, or was passed over to be thrown on a cross by uh, Judas Iscariot for money, and and he went into the temples and overthrew the tables of the money changers. He said, "I will not make my my uh, father's house a den of, of thieves and robbers." And anybody who goes to a church where they see their Bibles being sold inside of a bookstore inside of the church it's almost the same sort of sin and so just keep in mind that um, that's the way we need to deal with our the way we need to deal with in the government on how to how to deal with standards and how to create fair marketplaces is by coming by um, 
doing things in the open and and determining what we need to the, the truths what needs to be true and it needs to be open and free what is true it needs to people need to use their minds they don't need to be driven by emotion because that's where satan is satan is using is distracting us with emotion and um if we don't use our heads when we solve problems um we're not we're not we there's no reason for us to have this it it's not it's not a part of us um we are we're basically animals if without that and if we're not using that if we're just a being affected by emotion we're no different than an animal so so I think 